tales for dark nights. Silas Galloway found life thus far most rewarding. His work provided more than enough in the way of coin to fund his increasingly lavish taste and extravagant lifestyle. A modest yet exquisitely furnished country manor set deep within the rolling hills of Somerset was his to call home and provided the ideal backdrop to host his latest business venture. Personal wealth, however, was no longer the prime motivator for Silas. That had been surpassed by the craving for the intoxicating sense of reverence he seemed to generate wherever he performed. Adoration was his new drug of choice. The bulk of his clientele was grief-stricken people having usually suffered a recent loss. They were also generally blessed with deep pockets. In their eyes, he held all the answers. The payment of a few sovereigns mattered little when Silas was able to grant an audience with the deceased. Silas was, however, a fraud. His ability to communicate with the spirit world was merely a parlor trick. He could no more speak to the dead than he could walk on water. The idea had struck him in earnest one morning, long before he found his fortunes. Walking familiar streets, stomach empty, the previous night's cold still chilling his bones, he happened upon a funeral procession. A widow, attired in black and overcome with grief, had fainted directly at his feet. Clumsily, he had gathered her up and slapped her face gently in order to rouse her. The funeral party had drawn to a halt and gasped at the apparent assault taking place upon the woman. Yet, no one had rushed to her aid. Warily, she had opened her eyes. Silas had seen her reason and sense of duty, and was quickly restored. I am dreadfully sorry, she paused, searching carefully for her next words. Sir, I am quite out of sorts today, for my husband was taken from me not three nights ago. Tears had welled in her eyes. She trembled as grief took hold once more. Your husband must have truly been a great man, for all these folk have come to pay their respects. Silas had motioned towards the surrounding mourners. However, my lady, I believe although he has passed from the mortal plane, he will continue to watch over you for the rest of your days. Surprised, for he was unsure as to why he had found the words of comfort so easily forthcoming, Silas had blushed and nodded a farewell to the woman. A gentle smile had flashed across her lips, and she reached for his hand, leaving a gold sovereign upon his upturned palm. For your kind words, she had whispered, and with that she turned to retake her place behind her husband's coffin. A whip lashed loudly and the horses had resumed their trot towards the cemetery. Slowly the idea of trading comfort for coin had begun to take shape, and over time he honed his technique into a fine art. With some basic showmanship and a warm manner, he had become one of the region's finest and most respected mediums. What had begun as an innocent gesture of kindness was quickly replaced with the necessity to lie and cheat for as much coin as possible, as tastes of the elegant and exotic took hold. Silas discussed at length the possibility of using one of the famous talking boards that were popular with mediums and spiritualists all over the United States. It was at great personal expense that Silas procured one of the first Ouija boards to enter Great Britain. Lady Martha Appleby, her daughter Marcy, and Sir Henry Lloyd were due to arrive at his parlor shortly. The lady was positively overjoyed at the idea of using the new device. 
The board sat positioned in the center of a grand oak table, each letter elegantly styled, with a planchette set aside awaiting the touch of the inquisitive. Scattered candlelight completed the mood, allowing enough illumination to fall over the table, but shrouding the remainder of the drawing room in an uneven darkness. A storm was developing off to the south, which would further add to the ambiance of the evening. A sizable amount of gold was already promised to Silas, and he was confident that the scene would produce more. The wine grew warm and the polite small talk faded. An expectant hush befell the drawing room as all eyes turned towards the small wooden board. Each placed a finger onto the planchette eagerly waiting for communication to be established. Are there any spirit persons among us who wish to make themselves known? Asked silence aloud. The deafening silence followed. Ask again, please, requested Lady Appleby, shifting in a seat. If there is anybody with us now that wishes to communicate, please step forward. The sound of scraping wood came from the board. All eyes watched as the small planchette edged its way towards yes. Lady Appleby clapped. He's doing that. Are you not? demanded Sir Henry. Silas swallowed hard. He was not exerting any notable pressure upon the object. Indeed, it was his plan to move it himself, but only upon the third time of asking. Building suspense was all part of his act. Um, no, he replied. Tis the, um, it... It, it is a nameless spirit. He had paused, his usual veneer of calm failing him somewhat, but he assured them. Sir Henry looked little in the way of convinced. Silas continued. Are you male or female, spirit? The planchette made its way towards the number six. The group exchanged puzzled looks as the piece moved towards the number one and then returned back to six. Six, one, six. What kind of an answer is that? asked young Marcy. I'm confused. All eyes locked on Silas. Well, my lady, one can only assume our initial question is rather frivolous to this particular spirit. I suggest we continue in order to gather as much information as we possibly can. <coughs> Sir Henry scoffed dismissively and was met with a disapproving look from Lady Appleby. For years, Silas had led his clients into a merry dance, filling their heads and hearts with messages from the silent spirits. Yet, he felt little in the way of remorse for taking payment so deceitfully, for his customers all returned home happy. Do you have a message for us, O oh spirit? Silas continued adding a little dramatic flair to the proceedings. Again, the planchette followed the familiar pattern of crossing six, one, six. Sir Henry pulled his hand away angrily. Tis a lie. He plays us for fools in the hope of keeping us here long into the night. Tis a hunger for coin, is it not? The ladies removed their fingers abruptly, leaving a bewildered Silas touching the now motionless wooden tool. Of course not! 
I have merely opened the gates of communication to the other side. It, it is not I who decide what the spirits have to say. Then prove it for us, kind sir, mocked Sir Henry. Ask this next question without the touch of any upon the blasted thing. If it moves, I will pay for this whole charade myself twice over. Ordinarily, this sort of challenge would require the use of one of his more dramatic parlor tricks. However, he knew he was not the one dictating the movement of the planchette, and he was fairly confident that neither were any of his guests. Ignoring the feeling of unease that crept into his belly, he decided to take Sir Henry up on his boast. Six... One six means nothing to us here, O oh spirit. Do you have something useful to tell? Silas asked as his eyes met Sir Henry's glare. The planchet began to rotate, gathering speed with each revolution until a faint high-pitched whistle emanated from the center of the board. Oh my! shrieked young Marcy. Make it stop, begged Lady Appleby, her hands covering her ears. The whistle increased in volume and pitch until it was barely audible, becoming a painful sensation that drilled its way into its skull. Marcy cried, and Lady Appleby mouthed something incoherent. Sir Henry merely sat transfixed, eyes locked on the madness unfolding before him. There was a loud crack and Sir Henry spilled backwards from his chair, screaming. The whirling wooden tool was gone. Sir Henry staggered to his feet, the left side of his face a mass of blood, wood, and gore. The planchette embedded firmly into his eye socket. In a rage, he tore it from his eye with a sickening squelch, grabbed the wooden board, and broke it across his knee. God damn you, Silas, and your politrix! I will see that you pay for this! Spattered with blood, Marcy fled from the room screaming. Clutching his face and taking a weeping Lady Appleby by the arm, Sir Henry turned his back to Silas. I... I'm... I'm sorry! Offered Silas, but the dark edge of the room took them from sight. The days that followed were filled with an air of unease and anxiousness. The nights even more so. Something lingered in the air still. Something born unto the mortal realm on that wretched night. And there it dwelt, alongside Silas. The air in the house hung heavy with dread. Food quickly spoiled. Plant life wilted in the matter of hours. And guessed frequented the house less and less. Yet, Silas pushed the strange occurrences to the back of his mind. When questioned about the strong odor of sulfur that permeated the property, he pointed to poor sanitation and heavy rainfall. When the incessant scratching sounds were queried, he laid the blame on a particularly severe infestation of rats. Harder to explain still was the recurring six, one, six that appeared etched into furniture, daubed on walls, and lay cut into Silas's own flesh. As days blurred into nights and weeks passed with no sign of the mysterious activity ceasing, Silas became increasingly frail. Sleep seldom granted him reprieve. His dreams were haunted by screams of pain. Visions of hellish creatures scrambled toward his naked frame night after restless night, and he could no longer tell nightmare from reality. Sunlight offered little retreat Increasingly desperate whispers in unknown tongues filled his head. Several voices clamored for his attention, 
Yet all he could think of were those damned numbers. His world was crumbling, and his sanity hung by mere threads. For a man previously so stout in his belief that the afterlife was a myth, Silas realized that his personal life had become a terrifying case study into the existence of evil beyond the mortal plane. Silas's associate and only remaining friend, Joseph White, requested a small public demonstration of Silas's skills after discovering how far he had fallen in health and morale. He told Silas that he deemed it necessary to get away from the confines of the increasingly dilapidated house and the terrible influence it seemed to hold over him. One week later, Silas feebly picked his way through the gathered throng, towards the piled wooden crates that doubled as a makeshift stage. The last turnpike tavern had served the residents of Beechwood since the late 1700s, and on that rain-sodden night, most of the village congregated in its vast cellar for the highly anticipated public return. The air hung heavy with the smell of wet clothes and stale beer. A hush fell upon the crowd as Silas took his place before them. <clears throat> Thank you, one and all, for sharing the spirits with me tonight, Silas said aloud, a slight waver in his voice receiving a few appreciative nods from the crowd. Indeed, it has been a long time since I last communed with the deceased. I... He paused, not sure how to explain the terrors that enforced his absence, feeling an unnatural breath cold and rank on his back. He flinched, startling a few closest to him. There was a noticeable darkening within the cellar, and some shuffled nervously as Silas continued. Lest we forget that we, the living, have ultimate mastery over the dead. The sound of tearing cotton echoed just before Silas let out a piercing cry, falling to his knees. <laughs> Strips of red darkened his back and merged into one sopping blotch. Silas screamed again as his shirt tore once more. Strips of flesh flapped wetly across his lacerated back. <coughs> the patrons fled as Silas's back opened into a bloody canvas worked upon by unseen claws. Muttering what little resolve they remained, Silas stood up and stumbled crashing back to the stone floor. The few remaining onlookers backed away hurriedly as Silas pushed up the stairs and into the unforgiving rainfall. Joseph White remained in the cellar. Frozen with a mixture of fear and intrigue, he alone had witnessed the spectral attack in its entirety, his eyes now fixed on blood that glistened across the crates. Pushing disbelief aside, he hurried out of the deserted tavern after Silas. Although the rain lashed heavily at the cobbles, Joseph was still able to make out the trail of blood leading towards the barber's quarters further along the street. The door sat ajar, broken and stained. A scream of anguish rang from within the darkness of the building. Joseph raised his lamp and moved into the gloom of the barber shop. Another cry from deep within the shop echoed through the corridor. <coughs> Razor blades and scissors shimmered in lamplight as Joseph made his way deeper into the darkness. 
Something wet and rubbery caught under his heel. He reached down and peeled it off his shoe. Stay the hell away from me! Silas screamed, then let a cry of suffering that rattled Joseph to his very core. The lamp illuminated a cowering Silas holding a razor, already halfway through the cartilage of his left ear, the side of his face a gushing mask of red. I can still hear them! Make them stop! Make them stop! Make them stop! He wailed continuing to work the razor through cartilage. Dread overcame Joseph as he looked at whatever he had stepped on. A severed ear fell from his trembling hand. Silas held a freshly removed body part up to the lamp, grinning pathetically. I can still hear them! He cried. I can still hear them. Dr. Rutherford was proud of his patients. He believed in the quality of mental distress. His beloved Arlington Asylum elevated his practice from a mere hospital for the mentally disturbed into a pioneering center of psychological research. His interest in heightened at the news of a patient's arrival, one who demonstrated signs of demonic possession. Nonsense, of course, but another prized research subject nevertheless, and one he was eager to get his metaphorical teeth into, considering how many doctors had given up on the man, transferring him from institution to institution. The patient's cell lay on the deepest floor of Arlington Asylum, a necessity for some of the more vocal and dangerous. This is Mr. Galloway, said one of the burly orderlies. You may want to be careful with him, Dr. Raverford, he added, unbolting the thick iron door. Silas curled into a tight ball in the corner of his cell, frantically chewed at his wrist. A small pool of blood formed at his side where he rocked back and forth, eyes fixed at nothing. The walls were coated in excrement, and the numbers six, one, six, were daubed onto the dull grey brickwork. The smell of feces and copper hung heavily in the air. Treat his wounds and restrain him, Dr. Rutherford said. I recommend heavy sedation. If I deem him as unfit for study as I suspect he may well be, we'll arrange for a lobotomy. The orderlies nodded. Silas, continued to suckle greedily at his wrist, his eyes appearing empty. He shook, as though his head rang with a never-ending chorus of the damned. I'm posting this from a masked IP at a public location. I don't want to be traced for reasons you'll soon understand. I won't give my name and I won't give my alias. It's too easily recognized in certain circles. 
I don't want this making its way back to my doorstep in any way, shape, or form. You can call me X. Generic, I know, but that's the point. I was a contract killer, one of the best guns for hire on the East Coast, and I had the clientele to prove it. Greedy skimmers, stonewalling employers, blackmailers, rats, moles, kingpins, even cheating husbands. I've done it all, and at a high price, my customers were more than willing to pay for a job done right. I was professional and precise, methodical, no names, no personal information, no face-to-face contact, no wire transfers, cash only, anonymity, plausible deniability, and no personal involvement. These practices kept me alive and in business, and they were the reason my name was in such high demand. When I got the call six months ago that started all of this, I handled it the same way as all the others. This is the transcript. I keep an encrypted database with a kill switch protocol. You never know when the info could save your skin. Now, it just serves to remind me of my mistake. Date, 2013, 7.13pm. Tony's Greek Diner in Delhi. Take out or delivery? Uh, delivery, please. House or apartment? Public, um, uh, Parsons Place, that is. Hello? Location? Uh, Yes, am I speaking to Mr... Listen, my name is... No names. Location? Hotel, 10th floor, room... Tomorrow night, 8.30pm. Description? He's an ex-minister from St... Excommunicated for physical description. Ah, uh, yes, okay, uh, okay, he's, he's about six feet tall, mid-fifties, thinning, grey hair, slightly overweight, and walks with a bit of a limp. He wears glasses, has a scar over his left eye. Uh, he... 20,000 in unmarked fifties at the drop point. Four hours. Your contact knows the place. Be discreet. Don't be late. Understood. Listen, this is important. You have to know that... Leave special instructions with the drop. I can't stand chatty people. They're bad for business. I don't want to know you, and you don't want to know me. Some people seem to have a hard time grasping this concept. Jesus, I shouldn't have even taken the call. When he fumbled on the password, I should have just cut the line. I wouldn't be in this mess if I had just cut the goddamned line. I could say hindsight is 2020. I could blame the whole thing on the questionable and the unknowable, but I can't say that I wasn't warned. I just didn't listen didn't care to know more than necessary to the task at hand. When I collected the payment, I found more than the usual neatly stacked banknotes in a briefcase. I showed up at my contact's place of business that night, whose name I also choose to withhold, after hours in a safe room below his hardware shop where the real money was made. Shady dealings by the light of a low-hanging lamp. You'd be surprised how many people need a squeaky clean middleman who can keep his mouth shut. And I was one of his most loyal business partners. He slid the package across the desk toward me. A slightly stained gym bag lumpy with its contents. 
No marks for class or professionalism, but I'm sure it didn't attract any undue attention. I had to give it that much. The condition of the bag did not belie the crispness of the currency either. Ruffled and frayed from who knows how many tumbles and turns. Beneath it all, I felt something heavier and more rigid. I dug around and pulled out a small book bound in something that looked like leather and felt like stone. A dusty thing with pages yellowing at the edges and blackening at the corners. I held it up to the light, confused. What the hell is this? I asked. He sat back and lit up a cigarette. (laughs) Hell if I know. He huffed. But I think you need to be a little more careful with the jobs you take. The guy was a whack job. All nerves and a real liability. He paused for a long drag on his cancer stick. Not worth the paycheck, if you ask me. No disrespect, mind you. I just hope it doesn't come back to bite you in the ass. I listened with one ear as I thumbed over the book. It was full of crude drawings, symbols, and a lot of it written in a language I didn't recognize. A letter fell from beneath the front cover as I fanned through the pages. Enclosed in fine stationery and sealed with wax like something out of the 18th century. I broke the seal and unfolded a note written on some kind of thick parchment. It read, Mr. We sincerely apologize for involving you in this grim affair, but we have tracked Father too long and too far to fail now. We require an artful hand and a certainty that only you can afford us. That man's intentions are a profound betrayal and a dire sin, and his death matters more than your life or mine. There exists a world in the shadow of our own, a world of those who would do us harm, who seek a dark eternity for us all. He would loose them upon us. Please know that yours is a vital task and that a much grander fate rests in your hands. No matter the outcome, we humbly thank you for your service and your sacrifice. Go with God and may your aim be true. With admiration... This is some cult shit, man. I almost laughed. Is he serious? Mm, People don't leave massive bags of cash lying around when they're joking, he replied with a shrug. Shaking my head, I tossed the cryptic items aside and got back to business. I gave the cash my usual once-over. A quick flip through, checking for serial numbers and signs of counterfeit. Then tossed him a small stack of large bills for his trouble. I didn't bother with a meticulous count. That was his job, and I trusted him. We'd had a lucrative arrangement for several years, and he wouldn't jeopardize the loss of my business, let alone his life, over such a petty sum. With a mildly annoyed tip of the hat, I took my leave to make preparations. I almost made it to the front door before he tried to sell me on a new line of garden shovels he had gotten in stock that morning. You know, just in case I found myself in need of a quick disposal. He knew that part wasn't my job or my problem but it never stopped him from trying to make an extra buck at my expense. In fact, his sales pitches had become a routine part of my visits, as had my refusals. I decided to make my post at a nondescript office building two city blocks from the hotel. 
one of several I had identified and favored for their easy roof access and lazy contracted security. I showed up an hour early, enough time to set up shop and account for the typical human lack of punctuality. The sun had already nearly set, and the cover of night was a boon of which I always took full advantage, given the opportunity. I walked through the door in a mild gray suit and tie, slight five o'clock shadow, false mustache, and a salt and pepper wig, the visage of a middle-aged, constipated stiff opting for a late night at the office to avoid sharing a bed with his hag of a wife. My medium-sized briefcase didn't so much as raise an eyebrow as I approached the guard at the front desk. I passed him the doctored security pass I'd lifted off a careless employee earlier that day. I also took the time to make small talk, some bullshit about being transferred in for a week on a joint venture project and hating the hours. I find that friendly conversation usually instills more trust than a badge. I made my way straight to the roof, prepared to cover the security cameras, of which there were none. I found no use for my lockpicking set with the unlocked door, stepped through and found a good corner spot with no safety railing and a clear view of the hotel's west wing. The landlord was just begging for a lawsuit when some idiot wandered up for the scenery and took a fall, (laughs) but that carelessness was exactly why I chose the place. I opened the briefcase's polished latches and pulled the parts from their black foam inserts one at a time. The folding thumbhole stock clicked tightly into the upper assembly. I fitted the lower receiver and trigger housings to the forward grip. I slid the scope onto the mod rail and tightened the clamps. I screwed in and secured the barrel then ported the sound suppression jacket. I slid the bolt into the upper assembly. I paused for a moment and considered what I was doing. The note and book had scarcely left my mind since the night before, and the more I'd thought about it, the more I chastised myself for taking such a stupid job. A lot of what I did relied on the confidentiality of people who had the common sense to keep our business to themselves. My contact was right. This guy was clearly out of his mind, and I was taking a huge risk by involving myself in their affairs, even at an anonymous level. I mean, was I really about to clip a holy man over some delusional fantasy of spiritual warfare? Did this man really have to die out of fear that he may summon some kind of demon? I knew better than to let any moral conflict bother me. I knew it was just a job, but this was ridiculous. Did I really want to get involved with these nut jobs? What the hell had I gotten myself into? I guess it wasn't my place to judge. Sure, there may have been better reasons to end a life, but I was just the hired hand. A car washer doesn't question a man who brings in his clean ride for a detail, right? A pharmacist doesn't question a thin woman buying weight loss supplements. Besides, I had never backed out of a job before, and I didn't plan to start. If my reputation was going to take a hit one way or the other, I had might as well make good on my end of the deal. I checked the feed mechanism and loaded the magazine. Six rounds, 308 caliber, modified charge. I focused the lens and scoped my range. I closed and locked the bolt, and the round was loaded. The recoil pad sat firmly against my shoulder, and the weight of the rifle balanced on the bipod. 
I rested my thumb over the safety. I took a deep breath and I waited. As I stared through the scope into the room, the last rays of sunlight provided just enough clarity to make out a few important details. Clearly, the guy had occupied the room for some time, and he'd been busy. Just about every inch of the walls had been covered in the same gibberish from that book, written in what looked like permanent marker. He had torn up the carpeting and covered the floors in all manner of pentagrams and other circular symbols. At the center of each sat a variety of objects, including candles, piles of plants and rocks, and bowls filled with a number of different liquids. Last, but certainly not least, was the bed. It had been stripped down to the mattress, which had been painted over with one last incredibly intricate pentagram and thick iron chains and shackles trailed from the bedposts. Oh, sick bastard. The scene was almost cartoonish, really. The kind of thing you'd expect to see in a bad horror film or a haunted house. I wasn't keen on the idea of harming the mentally ill, but I figured he'd be better off if I put him out of his misery. Before I had much time to admire his work, my mark stepped through the door, lighting enough candles on his way in to give the entire room a flickering orange glow. He looked neurotic, fidgety and sweaty, and he constantly darted his gaze over his shoulder. I had a clear shot, and I should have just taken it, but I was struck with morbid curiosity. So I followed his movements around the room, the crosshairs constantly hovering over his eye. I watched his deranged ritual unfold, watched as he fretted over the minute placement of the random items around him, watched as he rubbed his hands together and gnashed his teeth in nervous anticipation. I watched as he muttered prayers into the open air from a book that looked much like mine, and watched as a laughable practice of a mad obsession turned to true horror. As the ritual pressed on, I began to feel the goings-on in that room for myself. And I mean that in the most literal sense. Something had gripped me. Something otherworldly, and the scope of my rifle became a portal of forced witness to the blasphemous and obscene. The cool breeze around me turned to the musty heat of candles and sweat. The scent of a gritty urban summer turned to the stench of his labors and the filth of his room, and the sounds of the roaring traffic below turned to his muffled mutterings and the banging struggle of someone or something behind the bathroom door. Though at a great distance, and though the crosshairs still marched over his left eye, I was suddenly there. I watched as he dragged the source of the noise from the bathroom, heard his grunts and his victim's muffled cries through the duct tape over her mouth as he dragged her to the bed, and heard the rattling of shackles as he unbound her limbs one by one, only to restrain them once again. She lay splayed out across the mattress, donning a wrinkled and stained nightgown, likely the nightwear in which she was abducted. She was to be some unseen something sacrificial meal, and the candle flames wafted and dimmed in the growling breeze of its hunger. My vigil's hold released me, but only for a moment, long enough to feel my index finger lightly caress the curve of the trigger, long enough to slow my hastened breath. I watched him press his hand against his mouth 
and pace about the room as he considered the gruesome next step. I could hear the anxious skittering and shuffling of the demons now, seeming to come from the very shadows on the wall, and many shrill voices chattered pleas for their feast. They grew irritated with his hesitation. I saw the terror in his victim's eyes as she caught the sheen of a blade drawn from his belt, a brutal dagger with a serrated edge, and she struggled against her shackles until her skin began to tear and bleed. I watched him approach her slowly with a look of sorrow and remorse upon his face, apparently an unwilling prisoner in this deed. My finger gently pressed the trigger as I watched him raise it over his head, poised for a downward thrust. The creatures in the shadows hissed and moaned their approval. He stayed his hand for several moments, as did I, until his resolve crumbled. He stumbled back and dropped the knife and he covered his face in tears of personal disgust. The creatures from the shadows wailed and shrieked with fury, and the room began to quake around him, shaking cabinet doors open and tossing aside the objects about the floor. The candles flared and raged. My panic released my mind, hurtling back to my own body, and adrenaline coursed through my veins. The sound suppression jacket made a harsh thump of a gunshot, and the left side of the priest's face shattered into a cloud of red mist as he fell limp and went crashing to the floor. Just as his head made contact with the hard wood, the candles extinguished in unison with one violent flicker, and silence and darkness befell the room. I cycled the bolt, and the jingling of the bullet casing against the cement became the only sound I could hear for miles. I kept watch through the scope, and a thin beam of moonlight shone through the broken window to show the unbloodied half of his face. I stared into his unblinking eye for what seemed like hours, trying and failing to slow my heartbeat. And then it happened. Slowly, soundlessly, a hand like a long bundle of twigs crept from the shadows wrapped its gnarled talons over his face, his eyes still visible between them, and dragged him off into the darkness. Fuck this, I stuttered to myself. Fuck this. I disassembled the rifle as quickly as I could and returned it to the briefcase. I rushed down the stairs and headed for a back entrance, stashed the rifle and disguise in a hidden compartment beneath my car's back seat, and peeled out of the parking lot into the busy traffic. I would be leaving the city, disposing of the disguise, the badge, and the bullet casing, and never look back. Less than a week later, I read about the priest in the papers. Their description of the crime scene erased any doubts I might have had about the reality of that night. They said that they found his body gnawed near to the bone. They said that the damage was so severe that they had to identify him by dental records, and the gunshot wound was far from the focus of the story. Strangely, they also mentioned nothing about the ritualistic scene or the state of the room. The girl, apart from slight bruising and a state of shock, had apparently been left untouched. I thought I'd be safe if I could just run far enough away, but fleeing did me no good. 
I pulled quite a few jobs since that night, all across the country, never inclined to stay in one place for too long, and all of my marks shared the same fate. I poisoned a slumlord in New Jersey, and I heard about his vicious mauling in the evening news the following night. I slid a knife between the ribs of a heavy-handed bookie in Northern California a month later, and I watched the hands claw him from my grip and into the shadows before he even took his last breath. I heard them devour a mafioso's ex-wife in her own bedroom. I can still remember the smell that followed. You see, I kept that book, and I've tried many times to make sense of what happened that night. I don't understand much. I don't know what they are or what they want, but I have come across a damning revelation. Apparently, apart from the summoning, the ritual was just a formality. These things only require a mortal, any mortal, to take the life of another in their presence. They feed not on the dead, but on the murdered. And once fed, they follow the hand that fed them, demanding sacrifice again and again until the killer's life is done. The priest had defied them, and they were not pleased. I, however, did not, and they collected their meal by my hand. He invoked their wrath and I don't know what would have become of him had I not pulled the trigger. However, his death was my first act of unwitting service, and now I don't know what will become of me if I stop. But I just can't send anyone else to that horrible fate. Until recently, I killed only for money. I justified my actions with the banality of evil. The idea that such things had become an inherent state of normality in society. I profited from death, but so did coffin salesmen and life insurance agents. People would kill one another with or without me. They'd murder each other for vengeance, petty theft, or their own self-righteous brand of justice. What made me so different? There was no guilt in the ordinary. Now that I've witnessed true evil, I can't justify my lifestyle that way anymore. I've seen what horrible things prey on us in life and in death. I've seen the dark forces that count on us to send each other to the grave, to do their work for them, and who hunger for us. I've seen what may await us in death, and I can no longer take a life so lightly. In living as I have, I wonder just how many I damned. I wonder if I ended the priest's suffering, or if I only sent him to an even worse torment. I can feel them growing restless. They're angry but I have fed them for the last time, and I will no longer run. Whatever comes for me now, I can't help but feel deserving. For all those lives I have ended, I can think of no other way to make amends. God, forgive me. Oh, I'm sorry. I am so very sorry. Maybe I allowed myself to be disarmed by the fact that he came at three in the afternoon. He knocked very softly for a man of his stature, hulking as he was at six foot four with wide shoulders and big hairy knuckles. When I asked how I could help him, he reached into his coat pocket, withdrew an envelope, 
and held it out to me. Who wears a coat in August? I took the envelope and looked it over. Its face was stamped over several times with information for the St. Louis Correctional Facility. A letter from prison. Great. I didn't know anyone in prison. Then I noticed a post-it note paperclip to the back of the envelope. It read simply, Please allow the courier to be present to witness the reading of this letter. I looked up at the man towering over me on the porch. Though he was large, he didn't appear threatening. If anything, his calm smile made me think he might be rather friendly. I asked if he had any clue about the contents of the letter or why his presence was necessary for the reading. But the tall man shrugged and gestured towards the foyer. I nodded and invited him in. In the kitchen, we both sat across from one another at the table. I offered him some coffee, but he silently declined. Glancing up at him one last time, I peeled the flap back and pulled out a ten-page letter, scrawled in hasty handwriting on lined yellow paper. The letter began, You don't know me. You will likely never meet me. I am on death row at the St. Louis Correctional Facility. I was locked up for the murder of my wife and two children. Lionel was three. Macy was just six months old. I loved them dearly. But I did kill them, I will admit that first and foremost. I hate myself for it, and I rot in my cell tortured by the images of their blood dripping off my knuckles. Let me tell you my story. I looked back up at the tall man with obvious disgust on my face. His calm, soft grin didn't waver as he stared back at me. I got up to get a glass of water and then returned to the letter. The author of the letter, whose name I found out was Fitz Willard, had been incarcerated several weeks earlier and had begun work on his letter as soon as he had access to stationery. He never explained how he got my address or why he chose me to share his story with, but the story was brutal. Fitzwillard claimed to have been cursed. My first thought was that he suffered from schizophrenia, but he explained that he had been tested for it, and everything came back negative. He insisted that a demonic spirit was attached to him. The evil spirit taunted him and tortured his every waking moment. It whispered evil deeds in his ear as he lay in bed at night. It appeared in his reflection as he walked past mirrors. The demon was constantly suggesting cruelties and filling Fitz's brain with insecurities, phobias, and sinister ideas. Fitz's day-to-day -day life became riddled by a running commentary on the weakness of humans, the frailty of flesh, and the freedom of bloodletting. Work meetings became haunted by the demon's screeching. The spirit hissed terrible things about every face Fitz passed on the street. Still worse were the demon's thoughts on Fitz's family. He called Fitz's wife a whore, called the children ungrateful bastards. The demon told Fitz that his family didn't appreciate him and that his wife was cheating on him, that his children couldn't stand to be around him and that Fitz could never provide enough for them, that their house was a sty, that their clothes were rags, that everything Fitz had worked towards his whole life was a mediocre joke at best. For ten pages, Fitz Willard recounted the madness that crept into his psyche the nightmares that woke him dozens of times at night. The demon made light bulbs flicker as Fitz walked under them. He made the bathtub run red like blood. Flies gathered on the mirrors, and the demon's suggestions became more and more furious. They became demands, threats even. Until one day, Fitz caved in. Caved in the skulls of his two infant children with his bare fists, before strangling his wife of eight years so hard that he fractured the vertebrae in her neck before she finally asphyxiated. That's how he ended the first letter. The tall man stood and nodded to me in silence, and then I let him out the front door. <laughs> Needless to say, I was shaken. Why would someone decide to share such a terrible story with me? The following day, the tall man stood on my porch again 
at three in the afternoon, and when I answered he handed me the second letter. As off-putting as I found the first letter to be, I realized as I sat watching television that night that I couldn't shake the story from my head. I took the second letter and led its deliverer to the kitchen table once again. I wanted more. What best describes the nature of the second letter? Dark? Twisted? Desperate? The yellow paper was rife with drawings of forlorn figures huddled in corners and tiny bodies splayed out in pools of pencil gray. Smudges of graphite made all the little doodles appear in shadows. The second page of the letter was just one big drawing. A woman's face twisted up in suffering, her mouth hanging open and her throat packed full of maggots. Spiders wrapped up in her hair, tears whipping down from her eyes. Her hands grasped her own face, jagged nails dug into her cheeks. That second letter gave a name to the demon. Grim Deed. Grim Deed the Tormentor. I glanced up often from the letter to the man sitting across the table from me. Did he know the terrible tale that I was being told? Is that why it was so important that he was present when I read it? His gentle smile never faltered, never faded, as he looked idly around my kitchen. Fitz elaborated on his descent into madness, about the tearful call he made to 911 as he stood over the lifeless bodies of his family. He talked about the trial and how, even in the courtroom, Grim Deeds sat behind him at the defendant's table and cursed everyone present. Grim Deed demanded that Fitz try for the bailiff's gun at the conclusion of the trial. And Fitz did. This led to a brief beating. Grim Deed said that Fitz should stand at the door of his cell, screaming profanity and threatening the guards. This led to a longer beating. Grim Deed told Fitz to spit at the judge the next day at trial. And as defeated as Fitz's poor conscience was by the demon's constant influence, he did. The letter ended with another drawing, this time of the whole courtroom strewn with slaughtered lawyers and the judge hung above his stand. All of it was in the smeared gray of pencil lead with grimy fingerprints pressed into yellow paper. On the third day, I was sitting at the bottom step just inside my door waiting for three o'clock. Right on time, the courier arrived and without a word between us, I let him walk through the door. He set the third letter on the kitchen table and sat down. His smile was brighter today, wider than usual. I suspected from his demeanor that he had just delivered the final letter. I peeled the envelope open and sat with a steaming coffee at my elbow. In his third letter, Fitz talked about his days in prison, how, even during his incarceration, Grimdeed the Tormentor haunted him. He described how slow the death penalty took, how he may die of old age in his prison cell long before an execution date was set. His penmanship became a barely legible scribble. His writing was frantic. He was a rat trapped in a cage, constantly prodded by the cruel musings of Grimdeed the Tormentor. Fitz's sanity had long since abandoned him. He doodled himself smearing what appeared to be feces on the walls of his cell with his hands. Fitz said he was thinking about ripping his ears off, in hopes that he would deafen himself and escape Grimdeed's whispers. The yellow pages had stains on them from Fitz's tears. He apologized for that. Then, on the last page, a spark of hope. As if Fitz had stopped and gathered himself, his handwriting once again became clean and clear. The last lines read, Grim Deed has grown bored with me. Being locked up like this, I can't do much evil worthy of him. He told me how to end my curse. Well, no, the curse never ends, exactly. This is why I'm writing to you. Pass the curse along to its next victim. But since I still have a sliver of humanity left in me, I'll at least tell you how it's done. You make someone else pick up Grimdeed's curse the same way I did, by inviting him into your home three times. My heart 
froze. I didn't dare to breathe as I looked up from Fitz's taunting signature at the end of the letter to find the tall man staring into my eyes. His eyes were an endless black. That cruel grin was wider than ever. Set flame to the letter. Grimdeed demanded. I've always had a fascination for the paranormal, investigating ghost stories and urban legends since I was a kid. If I ever heard a story that included the words, they say if you go there at midnight, then I was there at midnight waiting for a genuine encounter. In hindsight, I wish that I hadn't. If you chase a shadow long enough, you're bound to find the caster. Trust me when I say this, you don't want to know. Yeah, I know, that's how these stories usually begin. Please don't read this, or I don't care if you believe me. It piques your curiosity, keeps you reading. Well, I'm warning you now, and I want you to listen carefully. You don't want to know. Keep your thrills vicarious. Stay behind your computer monitor where it's safe. You're better off wondering and guessing. Because curiosity, without discretion, is a dangerous thing. I'm going to tell you how I learned it the hard way. And I hope it will keep most of you from meddling too much for your own good. You don't want to find yourself living like me. I'm not even sure I can call it living anymore. I only hope I can finish this in time, because most of the time I have these days doesn't belong to me. There have been so many myths, tales of gods, demons, spirits, and creatures of worlds beyond our own. The old stories changed over time, and beliefs changed with them. Yet, somehow mankind has always feared and worshipped the same things. Psychologists see this as a need for closure. They say we fear the unknown and we would accept anything to make sense of the world, even if it means believing in a total fabrication. Everything has a rational explanation, right? We live in a secular age, so that's the assumption. Then again, they also say that where there is smoke, there is fire. When I heard and read all of these stories, I came to question what society told me. Could they all really be superstitions of ignorant primitives inspired by firelight, paranoia, and mind-altering substances? Or were these truly things to be feared even before the songs and legends? That's what I wanted to find out. So I buried my nose in mythology books and ghost stories, and I kept my ear to the ground for urban legends. I explored them all. Well. All the local ones, anyways. I tested everything from the ghost ship of Hudson River to the infamous Bloody Mary. Every search was a disappointment, but it never discouraged me. It was a great hobby, and I still went through the motions just for the thrill. As I had come to expect, I never exactly struck gold. That is, not until the night of the blackout at 3rd and Main. It was the night of spring break after a long and grueling semester. Most of the other students migrated to Manhattan for loud, obnoxious parties. My small group of friends and I, on the other hand, preferred peace and quiet. Apparently, peace and quiet on that particular night meant a trip to a lively Irish pub called Piper's Kilt. 
Don't ask me what the hell we were thinking. I couldn't tell you. That is where I met a drunken old immigrant by the name of Tom. Tom was a strange man, which made the conversation all the more entertaining. Even if we did have to shout over some surprisingly upbeat song about a sinking ship, over the customary pint of Guinness, I told him about my little hobby, and he told me a story that, now, I wish I'd never heard. He said that Irish tradition runs far deeper than its Catholic years, and he told me about the long-held Celtic legends of the Fae. He told me of the Banshee, of the Fomorian giants, and of the leprechauns. To that last one, he added, I'll have you know, they are not the little people you've been told of, Sonny Jim. Aside from the conversation, the audience participation folk songs tend to grow on you once you're good and buzzed, and we stayed longer than I had expected. After a few more rounds, the night ended just as one would expect, a sobering visit to a terrible diner with terrible coffee. A dear friend also made it a point to get hammered beyond the point of no return, and I had to drive him home so he wouldn't end up parking his car in someone's living room. I slept on the couch with the intent of taking him to pick up his car in the morning, provided that he didn't wind up in a coma. I'd have been a hypocrite to look down on him, though. He had done the same for me in the past. Twice. So, after helping him up to his bedroom, nearly breaking my back in the process, I retired on the couch. I passed out after four episodes of an I Love Lucy marathon and a couple of annoying infomercials. Ordinarily, after a hearty helping of alcohol, it wouldn't take me so long to find sleep. That, however, was when I'm in my own bed. I never slept well in strange places. Plus, I still had that spirited racket of the old dun cow running through my head, along with old Tom's fascinating stories. I wish those waking hours would have lasted. They are the last normal memories I have. The last memories that I can confidently call my own. A few hours later, well into the hangover I had earned, I woke up to a dark house. Every standby light for every electronic device turned black, including the clocks. I peered through the window behind me, lifted one of the blinds and stared out across the street. Every porch light had died at some point in the night, and I couldn't see much of anything. I figured a storm must have rolled overhead and killed the power on the block. I'd slept through louder things on nights like this, after all. I was ready to ride it off and go back to sleep, but then I looked at my watch. The second hand ticked just past midnight, then slowed to a stop. Old Tom's final story came to mind. The old believers called him the Black Gambler, he told me, the tempter and trickster of the Fae folk, the greedy for wealth, and power bartered with him their souls called him on the darkest midnight hour, and he came as a dark man at the crossroads. It could have been a coincidence, sure. Most people probably would have ignored it. I, however, had a tendency to dismiss reason in favor of whimsy. It came with the territory. If ever there was a time to test the myth, I wouldn't have found one better. Of course, I had no expectations, as usual. I would take five minutes of my time to humor the old man, another two or three to take a much-needed leak, and head back to bed. With that plan in mind, I stepped at the front door and into the night. My first thought was that my previous assumption was wrong. I could smell no rainfall, could feel no moisture on the air, and there were no puddles or wet spots. There had been no storm. It didn't stir me, though. Blackouts can have other causes. More concerning was the darkness, 
and silence. It felt foreboding and wrong, but I dismissed it like everything else. I was just allowing my mind to play tricks on me. That was all. Just letting myself feel the fear I was supposed to feel, and the feeling subsided a bit when I saw the starlight overhead. That is the meeting place, he told me. Crossroads represent choice and consequence, and that's where you'll find him if he hears your call. So, minding my step in the dark, I approached the nearest intersection to my wasted friend's front porch, and I glanced at the street sign as I stood at the curb. Third and main. I stared at it for a moment before fishing in my jacket pocket for the next step. If you wish an audience with the black gambler, you must dig a shallow hole at your nearest corner. In that hole, bury a single key. That is the ticket to the space between our worlds and theirs. The place where he can see you and he may allow you to see him. Somehow, when I followed Tom's story, I'd imagined an old dirt road in an open field. I'd imagined an old antique key, a heavy thing you might suspect would open a dungeon or an old cellar. It felt ridiculous to make do with what I had on hand, and hope this fey person wouldn't be too particular. Fortunately, I had a selection of useless keys that would have impressed the janitor. I pulled out my key ring and selected a forgotten old thing that probably opened a padlock I lost. Part of its silver coating peeled away from the copper base. I removed a hefty clump of my dear friend's front lawn and placed it beneath, then returned the soil and patted it in. The job wasn't neat, but I doubt he would have cared. He wasn't exactly a proud gardener. Once the key's in the earth, you open the door between our worlds and theirs. Only mortals with dire purpose venture to the land between. So be careful and be sure. Be sure you're ready, lad, and don't step into the road until you are. With a deep, sarcastic breath, I assured myself that I was sure, and took my first step into the road, heading for the center of the intersection. I stood there waiting with my quiet, cynical streak for five minutes. Five minutes became ten minutes. Ten minutes became twenty. Twenty minutes became a week, which became thirty seconds. Two days, five months, an hour. 20 years, an instant and an eternity. Before I knew what was happening, my sense of time slipped away as I spiraled into a sudden, seemingly endless nightmare. At some point in that timeless hell, the trance over me subsided and I became aware of my surroundings again. This was the land between. I had expected it to be a state of mind, some exaggeration of an old druid's meditation but it was real. That is if real is an accurate word to describe it. It was unlike any place on earth, unlike anything I had ever felt. It's hard to explain to someone who has never set foot there, but I'll try. At first glance, it looks much the same as it does in our world. It has the same structures, the same colors, but you know something isn't right. That world is too still, like a rigor mortis snapshot of something that should be alive. There's no wind, no breath of life. It's a world not meant for us, and you come into it deaf and numb. You feel no heat or cold against your skin. You don't feel the ground beneath your feet, not even the movements of your own body. It's like an unending tomb, a world of stone where you feel nothing and float aimlessly in complete silence.
Listen for a voice, lad. That's him talking. You'll know it when you hear it. He sees you. That's when your test begins. Of course, I know it when I heard it. It would be the only thing I could possibly hear. And sure enough, I did. It was faint, almost not there at all, but I heard it. Under any other circumstances, I doubt I would have called it a voice. No human lips were forming those syllables, and that deep groan was not a sound from human vocal cords. Nevertheless, it was speaking to me. I can't tell you what it said, if anything at all. It was just an acknowledgement of some sort. Maybe even a greeting. It terrified me. You will first meet with a great beast, a thing of nightmares, and it will know you better than you know yourself. You will face it, and you will face all of your fears, all of the things that ever struck your heart cold, all of the things that ever haunted your dreams. He warned me, you must not run. To do so will break the right, and to break the right is to insult the gambler. You won't want to insult him, Sonny Jim. I can promise you that. The thing approached, and I felt its rumbling steps beneath my feet. Whatever robbed me of my senses began to return them ever so slowly, or perhaps they returned on their own out of some overpowering, instinctive necessity. Whatever the case, I would have received the beast with every primal sense fully alert. It emerged from the darkness down the road, a colossal mountain of fur and muscle towering over the dead street lamps, its grotesque form veiled in silhouette. It seemed all at once as a giant wildcat, a hulking bull, and a monstrous bear, and it lowered its face to less than two feet from mine. It growled and huffed, its breath like a hot sandstorm stinging my face, and I saw myself in its eyes. I saw myself as it saw me. That is where the true terror began. Old Tom was right. I did face all of my fears, every one of them. The fear of death, the fear of heights, of drowning, the fear of losing my job or of dying alone, the fear of accomplishing nothing in my life, the fearing the pressure and responsibility of leadership, the fear of my creepy neighbor across the hall, the fear of lightning storms and of the dark. Even my childhood fears, once funny in hindsight, came crawling back. The fear of seeing my grandmother for the first time without her dentures. The fear of the monster in my closet. The fear of large dogs. The fear of school bullies. And the fear I once felt when I was separated from my mother at a crowded mall. He'll be watching. If you pass the test. Because most don't. He'll take an interest in you. He'll come to you as a man in a dark cloak. And he'll ask you a question. A choice. One that only you can make. I didn't run. But it wasn't out of bravery. It was because I was frozen in fear. My legs quaking beneath me and in genuine tears that I hadn't spilt since I was a kid. I no longer needed to take that leak that I planned for. I stood there for another eternity failing to catch my breath for much of it. Then, I saw him standing at the corner, staring at me. He wasn't a man in a dark cloak. He wasn't really a man at all. The tales twist over time through poetic embellishment 
and mistranslation, so what you hear is never completely truthful. Then again, nothing the storytellers spin could prepare you for the reality of these things. There are simply no words to describe them. Even I am likely misleading you now, though I'm trying to be as literal as possible. Most cultures have their stories about him, and the way most describe him is honestly the most accurate way possible. He is a dark man at the crossroads. At all crossroads. And all crossroads belong to him. He didn't move at first. Instead, he spoke to me, and his voice was a soft breeze on the stillness, a wordless whisper. He did offer me a choice, though it wasn't a question. It was simply a curiosity for my will and true desire. If I truly wished what was to come, my answer came in spite of me, and the answer was yes. Yes, I would commit a sacrifice for his gift. Yes, a higher purpose mattered more than my life. And yes, I would do what was required of me for these things. He approached me, and I felt a biting chill blow past me as he neared. The closer he came, the less distinct he appeared. His shape wasn't that of a man, but that of a man's shadow suspended in the air, nebulous and immaterial. At a brief moment, I could see the vague suggestions of a face, but never enough to read his expression. He stood motionless before me for several minutes and then extended to me one intangible hand. Present the gambler with the possession of yours, an item of personal importance. He will turn it over in his hands for a time, understanding its meaning to you, and he will return it to you along with a gift. I had nothing of particular value on me at the time, let alone a personal value. I felt through my pockets until I came upon my old Zippo lighter. An old girlfriend passed it on to me once she decided to quit smoking. Funny thing was, she picked up the habit again after the stress of the breakup, and she wanted it back. Perhaps for an immature laugh, I decided to hang on to it. That was about the extent of its meaning to me. I didn't love it, but I liked it, and I hoped that would be enough. He did, just as old Tom said, and I swear I saw a smile in those vague moments of his face. In those last minutes, he didn't just examine that lighter. He judged my value, because this was not really a gift. It was an exchange, and after he was certain of his investment, he returned the lighter to me. As he placed the lighter back in my hand, the moment it touched my skin, the world went black. It was in that last instance of consciousness that I wished I had taken Tom's final words seriously. He will return it to you along with a gift in exchange for seven years of service. He always collects, so be sure this is what you want, lad. Be sure that it's worth it. Because your life belongs to him now. Since then, my life has been one of hazy nightmares, amnesia, and moments of clarity. I have gone to sleep at night, waking some days later in a sewer tunnel completely naked and holding mysterious, still warm, bloody masses in my hands. I have blacked out in mid-conversation, waking to see a television news report about a massive fire and the arsonist fit my description. I have faint memories of places I don't recognize, people I've never met, and even places that shouldn't exist. 
I have torrential dreams of lands between, standing at my master's side like a pet on a leash. The next time I saw Jack, the friend I drove home that night, it was at the doorstep of his family home with his wife and two children. He looked well, even fit. When I knew him, he was a sloppy, overweight bachelor and had bad luck with women. He'd also worn a ponytail in those days, and he was now balding. He said he hadn't seen me in years, and that everyone assumed I was dead. I begged for his help, and the next thing I knew, I awoke in a dark alley somewhere. I was covered in bruises and cuts, and I was holding Jack's bloodied wallet in my right hand. I don't know how long it had been, but... I have had a terrible realization. When it was said that he would demand seven years of service, it didn't mean seven years from that night. It meant seven years in total. I am a slave, and I can be spirited away at any moment. Sometimes I'll be fine for months at a time. Sometimes. I'll have my life back on track, assuming that the nightmare is over, but he always calls for me again. I haven't even had the time to learn of what gift he has given me. Like many people before, I am ensnared in his web, and until my debt is paid in full, I am an unwitting puppet. I may never be free. This is the last time I will say it. Stay behind your computer monitor where it's safe. You don't want to know. It's just not worth it. Convince yourselves that these things aren't true. Keep your curiosity in check. Force yourself to lose interest and find a new hobby if you can. If not for your sake, then for mine. I've already found the blood of too many meddlers on my hands as it is. He sat under the tree in the dark and stared at the illuminated stained glass windows of the church. A few late arrivals were hurrying from the parking lot. A pair of high heels clicked up the sidewalk, the last of the faithful sounding off the final seconds. The door swung open, letting a shaft of light pierce the darkness and then pneumatically hissed shut. The night service was beginning. Praise God from whom all blessings flow, the chant began, with the choir leading. He watched all this from the edge of the woods in his usual Sunday night seat. He stood and automatically wiped the pants of his new blue suit. It would be an hour now before the service would end and his mother would be back to pick him up. The eight-year-old boy dreaded the lonely Sunday ordeal, but he had stopped questioning his mother's absence. He was shunned by the other church members, and he knew it concerned his mother's past and the father he never had. At times he sat through the sermon, but the fear and tension that traveled through the crowd as they listened to the red-faced preacher frightened him. He dimly grasped the teaching of an ever-present danger of hell and damnation but his young mind sometimes rebelled and he sought a quiet forest. He could hear the breeze rustling the few remaining stubborn leaves. An occasional chill reminded him of the winter to come. Are you lost? The sudden voice shattered the quiet darkness and pricked the boy's heart into a racing flutter. He turned quickly and stared upward at the looming silhouette. The figure knelt seeming to telescope back to normal size after its eagerly exaggerated hugeness. A round face, impossibly round, with eyes yielding space enough for several noses, although one was not immediately apparent in the vast arena, leaned toward him. A mouth, large beyond belief, as if it served double duty because of the minute nose, curved across the face like the world's last river after all else has eroded to pale desert. I say, 
Are you lost, boy? Clenching bits of twigs and crushed leaves in his fists, the boy attempted to answer, but for the moment could only stammer. The gibbous face nodded with lips, stretching another inch in smile. Where do you belong? The boy found his voice at last, but it sounded awkward. The, the church. I was at church. He pointed back over the hill from where the distant rumble of the preacher could still be heard working steadily toward the meat of the sermon. Heavy, deliberate laughter came slowly from the crouched figure, as if much more was imprisoned in the barrel chest, but only a carefully measured portion was allowed to escape through those awful lips. Slipped away from church, eh? Slipped away to the woods. The man gazed about the dark forest. Couldn't stand to be cooped up, I'll bet. I can understand that. You'd rather visit with me than listen to the preacher go at it. Well, you found a kindred soul. I can't stand those Bible thumpers or close quarters either. The man's huge face seemed to blot out the small amount of nightlight that filtered through the trees. The boy tried to stand, but the man put a thick hand on his shoulder and held him firmly down. Now, where do you think you're going? The boy stared at the bulging forearm inches from his face. For a moment, he seemed to be counting the coarse black hairs that with the movement of the breeze appeared to be crawling along the arm. I, I have to go back now. They'll be missing me. The man laughed again. <laughs> no, son, you've made your choice. They wanted you, and instead you came here to me, and here you'll stay. I can't let you go now. We haven't got to know each other. I didn't ask for you, but maybe you can be of help. He tightened his grip on the boy's shoulder. I hope so. I really hope so. All of the boy's suspicions were aroused. A terrible possibility occurred to him. When he spoke, his voice was tiny, made small by fear. Who are you? What can I do? The man settled himself, facing the boy, and moved his hand to grip a leg just above the ankle. You tell me, boy. Who do you think you found here in the woods? His leg felt like a small rope in the man's grip, but the boy spoke his heart. I think, I think you're the devil. He trembled again. I skipped church, and you got me. The last words were drowned in the man's laughter, louder this time. <laughs> the devil, he chuckled again. I like that. You figure that out all by yourself in a minute of seeing me, when it's taken others quite some time before they call me by that name. He shook the boy's leg. <laughs> what do you think of this outfit? The boy stared closely at the man's clothing for the first time. He could see a loosely fitting white shirt and pants with a faded blue strip along the legs. The dark shape of a pistol butt protruded from the waistline. That's... That's like what they wear at the state prison. The man shook the leg in congratulations. <laughs> right again! You are a wonder boy. I've been in there visiting friends. The laughter returned. <laughs> yes, sir, I was just visiting with some good old buddies of mine who followed in my steps. He leaned closer to the tiny figure. But there comes a time to leave, and my time came. As enjoyable as the company was to me, you can't expect me to stay there a lifetime. Sure you can, but others might have different ideas. So, here I am, moving along at night, and running into you. Now, as to your help, boy. Well, I don't know right offhand, but it will come. It will come. You keep real quiet, and let's look at this church you left to find me. 
The man retained a tight clasp on one arm, but he let the boy lead him to the edge of the forest. They stared across a lake of asphalt that surrounded the church. The light from the stained glass windows revealed only a dozen cars hurtled close to the building. Sunday evening services were attended only by the elderly, the newly converted, and a handful of the always faithful. It was hard for the boy to believe that minutes earlier he had purposely left such a safe, warm place. He wanted to cry, but his fright was beyond tears. His small brow wrinkled with effort as he sought to radiate promises of everlasting goodness in the future for a bit of help in the present. The man squatted beside him while the strangely emotional voice from inside the church washed over them unheard. Even when the man spoke an inch from his ear, the boy could not look at him. A pretty little church, pretty. Not too large, but large enough for the faithful in a town this size, and large enough for me to find what I need to leave this place forever. I see some stairs there in the back, my boy. Do you know where they lead? The boy thought for a moment. It's a little room for the singers, the choir. That's where they put on their robes. The man tightened his grip on the boy's arm. Perfect. Exactly as I thought. But I needed you to be sure. A nice little choir room where they ready themselves to sing Thanksgiving. Do you remember seeing ladies' pocketbooks there? Purses, boy? Will they keep their money and car keys? When the boy nodded, the man embraced him quickly before turning the child to face him directly. Inches apart, the boy could not see both the man's eyes without turning his head. The breath from the worm-like lips was overpowering. He quivered in the man's arms, ready to faint, but the man shook him to attention. Now listen carefully, boy, for your life depends on you hearing and obeying what I'm about to ask of you. He turned his head slightly toward the church, as if to keep one eye there, while the other remained tightly on the boy's white features. Think of a lady in that choir, sitting just now behind the preacher, her hands in her lap waiting for the next hymn to be sung. Think of one in particular for me, boy. One who drives a nice big car you couldn't help but remember. The man turned the boy back to face the knot of cars. Maybe she drives that green one there, or that black one next to it. Just pick out one that belongs to some nice lady and you're certain is in the choir. The boy thought for a moment before answering. The black one. The big one. It belongs to the lady who plays the organ, but she dresses with the singers, too. That would do nicely, boy. She doesn't have to sing. <laughs> I'll sing for both of us for miles and miles. Now you, my little friend, just slip across to the church, up those stairs, and find the organ lady's purse. Don't try to bring it all back. All I need are the keys. Her little fold of money would be a nice present, but that's just a suggestion. The keys are the thing. The boy could not think. His mind swam with indecision while his body ached to curl on the ground and rest. The man shook him with impatience. You've got to do it. If you don't, I'll send you to hell in a minute and you'll never see your dear mother again. Ah, what we do to little boys when we get them there. But I don't want to frighten you with that. Do this for me and I'll let you go back. You're a tough little one. I could see that right off. And smart. A little girl I wouldn't trust with this job. But you can do it. And live to tell about it. The time you help the devil himself. He turned to the boy to face him again, and that wide mouth folded into a line of determination. You see this pistol, don't you, boy? 
Yes, I knew you had. As sure as I'm the devil himself, I can pop your little skull with this gun and send you to hell right now. Tears blurred the boy's vision, but he wiped them on his sleeve. <laughs> I'll do it. Just let me do it and go away. I, I won't ever skip church. The man interrupted. Now that's all right. You do this little thing for me and you'll have the devil behind you. Just don't bang about and get yourself caught. No excuses. If you don't come back, I'll carry you away to where the sun never shines and little boys cry for all eternity. After one final look at that terrible smile, the boy lunged from the forest toward the church. He could hear the low laughter over the soft padding of his feet and the quick gasps of his lungs. The wind cut through his thin clothing to damp skin, chilling him thoroughly. He felt no relief as the distance from the strange, awful man increased. The terrible, lonely responsibility was worse than the grip of certain death. He hesitated a second at the bottom of the steps, listening under the preacher's loud exhortations for the sounds of other adults. Hearing none, he climbed quickly and slipped into the small room. Coats, sweaters, and hats dotted a score of folding metal chairs. He found the purses grouped together in a corner. It took just a moment to find the one he sought, a green leather one large enough to hold a small dog. A frantic digging uncovered the keys, and he was quickly out the door and down the stairs. He stopped at the edge of the woods, unable to see the man in the darkness. After a few tentative steps, he listened carefully, but could hear only the night sounds of the forest. Relief was a moment from flooding his mind when he turned slightly, and his eyes focused on the man sitting just to one side of the path. The boy was more shaken by the silent discovery than he would have been from a sudden gesture or noise. For an eternity of seconds, they stared at each other without movement. The boy raised an arm, unclasped a fist, and displayed the keys. A long, even row of teeth appeared in the dark face. Ah, the keys. Well done, my boy. Well done. Now we must give him a try, and quickly, for this silence no doubt means the prayer at the end of the sermon. That leaves a verse or two of him, a benediction, and then a swift, sure discovery of your little theft. He rose and stepped to the boy's side. Perhaps we'll be lucky, and a few lost ones will choose this moment to step down the aisle and prompt another verse or two. I, I can't go with you. You said if I... The man grabbed the boy by both arms. Now, now, I know what I said. Just come with me to the edge of town. If I free you now, your hallelujahs might embarrass me in front of the congregation. The man tucked the boy under his arm, and his free arm kept all screams and cries from escaping. As they crossed the parking lot, the boy, half choked and dazed with fear, ceased to struggle. The car started easily and the man edged it slowly away from the church toward the highway. In a few moments, the town was behind them and the man sighed with noise and apparent relish. He watched the edges of the highway carefully. <sighs> Need a little road. A nice quiet road for us to conclude our deal. The boy stirred in the front seat as the car left the highway and bounced in the ruts of a dirt road. His eye fell on the black grip of the pistol peeking out from the loose clothing and a desperate hope was born. The man did not stop until the road ended at the ruins of a burned homestead. A bleached chimney tottered over the weeds. The man turned toward the boy and sighed again. You know, I'll make a pretty poor devil. Until now, I've done my best with the role. 
He shook his head. But I have to admit, temptation came my way at last. I mean, boy, I was actually tempted for a moment to let you go. The boy crouched in a corner as far from the massive figure as possible. His fright was bottled up and put away. His body tingled with alertness. One small hand slipped from a jacket pocket and crawled along the seat. When he spoke, the boy didn't recognize his own voice. You promised. The man suppressed a laugh. <laughs> Sometimes I promise too much, boy. I did threaten to send you to hell. The dark figure moved across the seat. But since you were such a good fellow, I'll send you to heaven instead. At the movement, the boy deftly snatched the pistol and pointed it at the massive head. He saw the startled look on that hideous face as his finger searched for the trigger that was not there. Not understanding, he jerked back against the window and in the moonlight stared with horror at the crudely carved piece of wood covered with black shoe polish. The same moonlight gave him one final glimpse of that wide, awful smile. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.